My name is Emily Tweed. I'm a clinical lecturer in public health at the University of Glasgow. And I'd really like to give you a warm welcome to the FINS 2021 webinar series and to the first event in this series. And um, so for those who are not familiar with FINS, it's the Public Health Information Network for Scotland. And FINS webinars have been going for over 20 years, um, in the last two years virtually. And um, they've been organised by the Glasgow Centre for Population Health and Public Health Scotland as part of the SCOTFO collaboration. So this year, we've got three separate online webinars, and they focus on the continuing impact of COVID-19, that's today, the commercial determinants of health, and approaches to addressing post-COVID societal inequalities. Um, we'd really like you to tweet about the webinar and get the discussion started, so you can use the hashtag FINS2021 to do that. The webinar is being recorded, and it will be available after the event, along with copies of the presentation slides on the Scotford website. Um, and those links will be emailed to you when they're available. So the format is that we've got two 20 minute presentations by our speakers, and then at the end, we'll have 15 minutes question and answer with both. So if you'd like to ask some questions, and we'd really encourage you to do that, please use the Q&A tab uh, at the bottom of your screen, and we'll put a selection of those questions to the speakers. So um, to move on and introduce our speakers. So first up, we have Suzanne Fitzpatrick, who's Professor of Housing and Social Policy in the Institute for Social Policy, Housing and Equalities Research, iSphere, at Harriet Watt University. Okay, Suzanne, take it away. Thank, thank you very much, Emily, and thanks very much for the invitation to, to um, speak to uh, the, this audience this morning, it's, it's, it's always really nice to have the opportunity to connect with um, people in the in the public health world. Um, I think that you know the links between social policy and public health could really do with strengthening. So it's it's fantastic for this opportunity to to speak with you this morning. Um, the topic I've been given is the impact of COVID on on people experiencing uh, homelessness in Scotland, um, and I'm going to um, try and share my screen again. <laughs> Am I sharing? Yeah. So I'll be I'll be drawing on <clears throat> on three research projects. And um, the first one is called the Homeless Monitor Scotland, which actually was just published yesterday, um, which is an a, a, a very long term, in fact, fifteen year uh, research project that covers the whole of the UK and is and publishes so annual State of the Nation reports on homelessness. Um, across the UK, or, well, in England and in alternate years for um, Scotland and the other uh, UK uh, jurisdictions. Um, also drawing on a, on a um, project um, called the COVID-19 Crisis Response to Homelessness in Great Britain, which is an ESRC funded um, piece of research, part of actually the, um, uh, the um, a research, an ESRC funded research centre that's based at the University of Glasgow and a housing evidence centre. Um, and also, a um, bit of an eclectic mix here, an evaluation of a global research um, uh, 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 initiative on people who are uh, sleeping uh, rough in cities across, uh, 13 um, cities across uh, the globe. Um, and I won't go into the details of that project, but the key thing for this morning is that Glasgow is one of the case studies um, in that project. And across all of the, the I won't go into the, the details, obviously, the methodologies, and these are all very different projects. But the key thing is, in various qualitative and quantitative ways, they allowed us to capture some of the experiences of people who are homeless during uh, the COVID pandemic uh, in Scotland. And I suppose one point to make at the outset that might come as a bit of a surprise as in lots of ways this is actually quite a good news story um, in terms of the response certainly relative to what happened in other parts of the UK uh, and other uh, parts of the world. So moving on to the sort of substance of the of the presentation moving on to the next slide. Um, in Scotland uh, what we found um, across these various research projects was actually there was quite an effective COVID response uh, to homelessness in Scotland. Now in some ways that reflects the pre-COVID position in Scotland which is that we have um, the strongest statutory safety net for people facing homelessness anywhere actually in the world uh, which means in, in short that um, not only families but single homeless people in Scotland are entitled to be permanently rehoused. Uh, at least the great majority of them have that entitlement. That entitlement is not always properly implemented, particularly actually in Glasgow, um, but the entitlement is there and it provided a different context going into the pandemic than you had certainly elsewhere in the UK 
where the, uh, the government in England and in Wales um, and to some extent in Northern Ireland had to step up with really quite dramatic interventions um, uh, to protect single homeless people sleeping rough or at risk of sleeping rough. The, the, um, the, the intervention in Scotland didn't have to be quite so dramatic because we had those background uh, entitlements. But nonetheless, there was intensive joint working between the Scottish Government, local authorities and third sector organisations. Um, supported by rapidly mobilised funding by the Scottish Government to um, assist those people who were sleeping rough or, live, or staying in communal forms of provision which weren't safe during the pandemic. Again, in Scotland, that's relatively unusual. There's, there was only, at the beginning of the pandemic, there was only two night shelters in Scotland, um, one in Edinburgh, one in Glasgow. Um, but people who would otherwise have used those shelters and also um, other people at risk of sleeping rough were assisted through a rapidly um, activated programme which focused mostly uh, on Glasgow uh, and Edinburgh. And the Scottish, I think the key thing is the Scottish Government has showed real kind of leadership um, as well as putting um, uh, money in place to, to, act, uh, to act quickly. And crucially, the group who are at most risk of slipping rough in Scotland, of course, are people with no recourse to public funds. And because um, street homelessness was reconceptualised uh, as a public health emergency during the COVID pandemic, um, those people were included um, in these efforts to, to give everyone somewhere safe to stay. Something else that came out of uh, a range of the projects that we've been doing is that in some ways the, the pandemic, obviously uh, tragic and horrific as it was, for this particular group did provide an opportunity to effectively accommodate people um, who, whose support needs um, meant that uh, it was, they had long histories of homelessness. Um, and, um, and for a whole range of reasons, it, it was often difficult to <clears throat> provide them with the, with the really intense support that they needed. And they were, to some extent, a sort of captive audience when they were um, staying in the hotels and other um, forms of self-contained accommodation that was, that was provided during the pandemic. And it allowed a combination of that and also the, 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 the kind of flexibility that the parallel, that the, um, frontline agency showed meant that there was a kind of unparalleled um, opportunity to engage in intensive multi-agency uh, working. So there was a lot of there was a lot of positives in what happened uh, in, in, in the COVID uh, response, um, specifically in terms of the sort of targeted response for people at risk of, of, of sleeping rough. But moving on to the next slide, I think what was also very important to acknowledge is the wider um, support of policy changes uh, that were made. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, could you move on to the next um, slide, please, Karen? <clears throat> so I think there's one missed out. There should be one in between those two. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, there's there was also support of wider policy changes instituted both by the Scottish Government and uh, by the Westminster uh, Government. And the data in this slide is from a survey of a national survey of local authorities that we undertake as part of the Homelessness Monitor. Um, and 29 out of the 32 Scottish local authorities responded uh, to the survey. So it's, it's only very, very small authorities that didn't respond. So this is a good um, representation of, of, the, of the position across the country. And um, one of the key things that happened very early on in, <coughs> excuse me, in the pandemic <coughs> across the GB countries um, was uh, various forms of moratoria on, on rental evictions um, for uh, rent arrears. And this was overwhelmingly universally seen as absolutely critical in stopping there being an avalanche of, 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 um, of new homelessness applications during the pandemic. So 29 out of the 29 local authorities saw that as very important. Also, other moves by the Scottish Government that were considered very important were um, additional funding through discretionary housing payments and the expansion of the Scottish Welfare Fund, which provides emergency um, cash and, and loans for people who are... Um, uh, mostly for people who are on, who are on um, already on welfare, income maintenance, welfare benefits of various kinds. So almost all of us saw those things as very uh, important. Um, there was also additional money provided for what, what um, are called rapid rehousing transition plans, um, which is a pre-COVID effort to move people through temporary accommodation more quickly into, into settled um, housing. So there was a range of ways in which um, the Scottish Government helped beyond the sort of targeted rough sleeping initiatives, but also in the background were the, the Westminster Government um, 
uh, initiatives which everyone will be familiar with, the furlough scheme, the uplift in universal credit, but also the, the suspension of benefit sanctions um, and, and also debt deductions uh, were very important early and they, they only lasted three months but were very important early in the lockdown period. As was the raising of, of local housing allowance, which is the um, housing benefit that's paid to private tenants, probably less overwhelmingly important than it was in England because our rent levels are not are not so high, but nonetheless um, pretty important. So a lot of positives, um, but moving on to some of the, the more negative aspects of the of the um, responses. There are certainly are limitations uh, to the COVID response to homeless people in Scotland, and some of them are about the temporary nature of these protections that were put in place. So the ending of evictions restrictions um, in Scotland, all local authorities um, felt we were likely to increase um, PRS, private rented sector evictions related to homelessness. So everyone's really waiting with bated breath to see what happens as those restrictions unwind and as those cases um, make their way through the courts. Obviously, the, temp uh, the UK government welfare mitigations were, were almost entirely temporary. Um, and other limitations and concerns focus not so much on government actions, but on other key stakeholders, particularly housing associations. Access to social housing dropped dramatically during, during the COVID pandemic, particularly in the early stages of the lockdown, and there were far fewer social lettings made over the course of uh, the relevant financial year. That said, um, what we found across a range of the projects is while housing associations really shut up shop, mostly at the very early stages of the pandemic, not all of them, but most of them, um, by the autumn of 2020, many of them had really stepped up and prioritised um, lettings to homeless people. So there was a real big turnaround and a big effort made later in the year to try and assist um, on the homelessness front by many housing associations. Um, but another key concern um, was the insufficient nature of the support that was offered to those in emergency hotels, particularly at the start of the pandemic and especially uh, in Glasgow. So moving on to the next um, slide, uh, Carol, I think it's worth just dwelling briefly on how bad these challenges were. I mean, you think about the position in Glasgow, you had at the height about 600 to 700 people staying in emergency hotels in the city centre. These were largely people with pretty extreme complex support needs concentrated together in hotels that were in the city centre that really weren't geared up to provide either the practical help that people needed with things like laundry and food and so on, at least to begin with, but also to deal with the, the challenging forms of behaviour and so on. So it was a pretty catastrophic environment um, for the first few weeks there. Um, and, you know, these quotes give you a bit of a flavour of that. So you had these very exploitative situations and again, a captive audience um, in the hotels for people who were looking to exploit that situation, drug dealers uh, and others. And, you know, the city council and the police and the, the voluntary sector did get on top of the situation and it improved um, really markedly uh, as lockdown uh, went on. But in those very first uh, few weeks, it was universally acknowledged that things were very, very uh, difficult indeed. But moving on to the next slide, um, nonetheless, if it, infection rates were kept to, kept to a minimum. I mean, this is something that no one really quite understands, to be honest. Um, but at least perhaps um, in, this, in this audience, people understand it, but in social policy, homelessness policy world, people are quite amazed by this, that infection rates were kept to a minimum, both in, term, in the emergency hotels and in other homeless hostels and, and environments. And given that this was a group of people who were probably still out and about more than most people um, during the early stages of the pandemic, there is really um, quite a lot of surprise and, of course, massive relief uh, that that was the case. Um, moving on to the next slide. Um, I think one of the big question marks that we have now really is whether some of the positive things that were introduced during the pandemic can be sustained um, in the longer term. And, and I mentioned towards the beginning of the presentation that there was a lot of um, emphasis um, on sort of more flexible, um, more intense, uh, multi-agency supportive working with people who often had really not been able to um, get the help that they needed um, be before the COVID pandemic. 
And one of the things that was striking in Scotland, very different from England, um, actually, uh, especially, was there was quite a lot of, uh, of, of optimism that these positive kind of e extra forms of flex could be maintained post um, the, the pandemic. There was also quite a lot of um, optimism that the Scottish Government and the City Council wouldn't basically end the emergency provision, including for people with no recourse to public funds and sort of turn them out. Um, on, onto the streets, which you know has happened in England, at least in, in many parts of England. So the, 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 there was kind of, I mean, I suppose time will tell, but there's quite a high degree of, of optimism up in the voluntary sector as well as in the statutory sector that some of the gains um, can be can be sustained. And moving on to the next um, slide, I think I probably only got sort of five minutes left or, or so. Um, so I just want to capture quite quickly some of the statistical um, evidence um, for some of these positive and other impacts that, that, that I've mentioned. First of all, we can see in this slide that rough sleeping um, declined um, during the, the pandemic. This is data that's captured by local authorities when people apply as homeless when they ask people whether they've slept rough the night before presentation or, or within the last three months. And, you, and we've had a pretty stable position on that in Scotland for a long time and that really did um, thanks, Emily. And that really did decline during the during the pandemic. Moving on to the next um, slide. But what we found in terms of statutory homelessness, which is you know people coming forward and applying as homeless, um, that really did decline as well during the pandemic, mainly because of the eviction um, the eviction ban. Um, and you can see that in the, the red and the grey lines at the bottom of this of this chart. But at the same time, that issue with housing associations and local authorities um, really cutting back on lettings in the early part of the lockdown. You can see in those top two lines. So basically, people were stuck in the system. There wasn't the same throughput. There was less. There was less inflow, but there was less outflow as well. Uh, next slide. Um, and you can see that this was also reflecting the reasons for homelessness changing during the pandemic. So there was a real decline, a massive decline in the number of people applying because of rent arrears, so 80% decline in terms of social rent. Um, uh, but, but at the same time, there was um, a modest increase in people um, applying for other reasons to do with relationship breakdown and domestic uh, violence. Moving on to the next slide. <clears throat> and while there were there was a reduction in people coming into the system as i've said there were a, an increasing number of people sort of stuck in temporary accommodation and um, because of the difficulties in, in throughput which you can which you can see there but moving on to the next slide i think it's important to put these figures you know there was there was an increase in temporary accommodation and shelter and others might have quite a lot to say about that but i think you've got to put that in the, the longer term context where the number of children in the worst forms of temporary accommodation and bed and breakfast has plummeted over time as a direct um, uh, result of, of, of policy decisions that have been made in Scotland. So although there's been that little bump up during COVID, it's it's against a, a very um, you know a, a very positive base. And if we can just skip on to the second to last slide, because I know I'm, I'm running out of time. So if we can just um, uh, move on again, Carol. Um, yeah, well, if we just stay, um, stop there for a, for a, for a moment. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I, I said at the beginning that the response to homeless people during COVID it has to be viewed in the broader context of a fairly positive policy context in homelessness in Scotland more generally. Certainly there are issues, um, but as compared with other parts of the UK, um, there are much stronger sets of entitlements and, and much more active policy. And just pulling out um, two or three aspects of that, which will be um, important to the kind of, um, you know, uh, well, to, to, to people who were caught up in the, the COVID uh, pandemic um, uh, and homelessness, but also people facing homelessness more generally. There's a number of things I think that are really positive going forward. First of all, is the, is the end to the use of night shelter and dormitory still provision altogether in Scotland. That came about from a concerted effort by a set of voluntary organisations. Um, and uh, with the support of the Scottish Government and COSLA um, and the relevant city councils. So the Edinburgh and the Glasgow night shelters have now closed and been replaced with more appropriate self-contained provision. That's really unique to Scotland and um, that hasn't ha happened elsewhere in the UK and certainly not happened elsewhere in the world in the studies that I've, the, the, the places I've been looking at. So that's something to be very uh, proud of. Um, there were 
improved responses to those with no recourse to public funds and the Scottish Government and again um, a collaboration of um, voluntary sector organisations have worked together very closely to develop a pathway to ensure that we don't go backwards in that in terms of destitution and, and rough sleeping among people with no recourse to public funds. So there's really, it's not certainly not fully implemented yet, but there's a, there's a, we're, we're on a, we're on a very positive pathway in Scotland to, to ensure that we don't go backwards to people sleeping in the streets um, for that reason. And finally, and this is something I've been heavily involved in pre-COVID, um, is crisis um, set up at the invitation of the Scottish Government, a review group, a review group, prevention review group, to bring forward um, recommendations for wider public sector duties uh, to prevent homelessness in Scotland um, and to clarify and extend local authority duty to prevent homelessness. And the Scottish Government has announced um, that it will take forward those recommendations and we'll consult on them shortly. So I think there's a lot of there's a lot to kind of um, be optimistic about uh, going going forward uh, as well and I think there were some important lessons learned in terms of some of the things that went wrong during Covid too. And just finally the very last slide has um, the links to the to two out of the three reports that I've drawn on. The Homelessness Monitor Scotland I said was actually the latest one was published just yesterday. Um, the Covid crisis response which is a GB wide study um, is it uh, was published um, in, back in February, I think, um, by um, uh, Cash, the SRC Housing Evidence Centre. The other, uh, the other link I've included there is the Everyone Home Scotland um, Collective, which is this group of um, vol mostly voluntary sector organisations that have done fabulous work uh, during the COVID pandemic to really push forward um, on, you know, ending the use of night shelters. Um, and, and helping people with no recourse to public funds and also ending evictions uh, from social housing and, and a whole range of other initiatives with the support of the Scottish Government. So it's worth looking at that website as well. Thanks very much, Emily. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Suzanne. That was really interesting and it's interesting to reflect on some of the positive lessons as well as the negative um, from the past 18 months. So thanks very much for that. Um, so moving on. Um, well, before we do, I'd just like to invite you to add your questions to the Q&A for Suzanne, because we'll come to those right at the end. Um, and now for our next presentation, we have Eileen Scott, who's Public Health Intelligence Principal in the Evidence for Action team at Public Health Scotland. Um, so Eileen, if I could invite you to share your slides. Can you see those, Emily? Yep, that's brilliant. Thanks very much, Eileen. Perfect. Um, well, first off, like Suzanne, I would like to thank you for inviting me to come in and chat to you today about the impacts of the pandemic on young people's mental health and well-being. Just to set a little bit of context about my role. So I sit, as Emily said, within the Evidence for Action team, where I manage um, uh, technical experts who look at what works evidence and in particular cover um, some of my team covered health. I also lead the World Health Organisation Collaborating Centre on Child and Adolescent Health and sit on the Scottish Government's COVID Advisory Group for Education and Children's Issues. So hopefully what I can bring to you today as well is um, some perspectives that, that we've in the international and the national. Um, and I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey from the, the what we know to why it might be, to what we might be able to do about that. So, oops. Excellent. I think to set this into the context first though, and when we're thinking about child and adolescent mental health and, and young people's mental health, I think it's really important to contextualise it and say that these were already significant concerns and increasingly uh, an issue, not just in high income countries across, for example, um, the WHO European region, which covers 53 countries. So that covers from Iceland down to Armenia. So it covers a range of countries with different incomes, um, geographical distribution, etc. And 
what we know from that, so from some work that myself and, and Ross Whitehead and my team have done with WHO is that adolescent mental health and well-being is one of the key issues and concerns around health for this age group. Generally, adolescents and young people are, are healthy physically, um, but we know that, for example, suicide is the leading cause of death in adolescents in low and middle income countries in the region and also the second leading cause of death in high income countries. That's mortality. The morbidity burden is equally high and we see the distribution of um, mental health challenges are particularly greater among um, adolescents, so older adolescents, girls, and we see the very familiar socioeconomic patterning. So those who are in more deprived economic circumstances, we see greater levels of, of mental health issues for them. Now, why is this really critical? Well, we know that um, most lifelong mental health problems merge during adolescence and certainly before the age of 25. So we have a critical and sensitive period of development here where also there is an opportunity both for prevention and early intervention. So it's really a, a critical area and critical agenda for public health and, and one of the key concerns um, for the World Health Organization and the region. But there are challenges and this also Will be a challenge for us in understanding the impacts of the pandemic as we go forward and also cross-national comparison because um so for example ross and i also worked with you can see the image of this report here it was a state of child health across the european region survey so we um who sent out a survey to the 53 member states and we worked with them to write that up into this final report on the success of otherwise the child and adolescent health strategy and that went to the health ministers of the 53 countries and what we did was that the the survey was sent out to these governments and we asked them about what the key issues were for them for child and adolescent health and well-being what their associated policy and practice was and i think it would be fair to say that actually what we got back was really stark in terms of mental health and well-being, particularly around a lack of quality data. So many countries actually lack the ability, they, they don't have the data on indicators, even on, on sort of what we might think of as being fairly straightforward indicators, for example, um, the prescriptions of antidepressants or anti-anxiety medication or the rates of treatment for these conditions. Um, I think it's also fair to say that for many countries that they they don't necessarily have the skills or capacity either to do data collection and analysis and that's something that that really is quite a pressing need for for actually development and um i'm always very pleased that i come from scotland and very reassured because when we go into these forums people talk about actually the quality of data that's produced in scotland and um i think again we're ahead of the game colleagues jim parkinson rory mitchell and others are currently working to develop a, a new set of child and adolescent health indicators which are going to be really important for us again moving forward but it does mean that we have a challenge both in terms of countries tracking trends around um, adolescent mental health and well-being and the well-being of young people um, and also inter or cross-national comparison it makes it very difficult to benchmark um, so we are generally left with these fairly blunt indicators um, so for example the, the rates around suicide but in Scotland as I mentioned our data um, is generally um, much better I think it, as we I've highlighted we, we can still improve um, on that and that, that work on indicators is progressing but we do know that for example we had seen in that period prior to the pandemic a 20 percent increase in referrals to CAMS over the three years preceding so what we have is that trend towards an increase and whilst you know, we, we can acknowledge that um, CAMS referrals are, are the tip of an iceberg. They are quite a useful sentinel indicator in telling us what, what's generally happening in terms of young people's mental health and well-being. Um, 
I am going to come on a bit later to talk about the evidence does suggest to us that the pandemic is having is exacerbating pre-existing trends. It has increased the factors which we know increase the risk for poor mental health at the same time as reducing those things that we know for that that have a, a really important mitigation against that and, and help to reduce inequality. So if we were, for example, to think about the impact on education at the peak of the pandemic, UNESCO data suggests that 1.6 billion, so that billion children and young people were not in education. Their schools were closed. Now, in high income countries that have um, systems and structures that enable you know education to recover quite quickly you know we will see the or we have seen a return to education at greater pace but across the world and particularly in some of you know our lower income countries some of those children and young people who've been lost to education will never return so exacerbating the existing equality that we have seen in those countries so the recovery of this for this generation, whilst they may not have been particularly clinically affected by COVID-19, has the potential to be, you know, an incredibly long lasting impact at a national and international scale. When we're thinking about pandemics, so things that we understood as a team, was to try and understand if we were thinking about what we might be able to predict and think about what um, mitigations you, you might be able to put into place to, to address some of these concerns was what could we find out from past outbreaks. So two members of my team, Graham Scobie and Ross Whitehead, had undertaken a rapid evidence review early last year looking at you know, what were the non-communicable disease um, outcomes from previous infectious disease outbreaks. Um, I think it's important to acknowledge, though, that whilst the the evidence had come, it was relatively recent. It was um, predominantly focused on uh, the SARS outbreak and H one N one. It it's fair to say that nothing has been at the scale that we have seen, or for the duration. Um, so the evidence is quite limited in what it could tell us, anyway. But um, in terms of specifically mental health and well-being, the evidence was, um, I would say, quite thin <laughs> and not generally of high quality studies. What we did have suggested that there was high, a high psychological and mental health impact of this kind of situation. And that that was particularly borne by healthcare workers. Um, the longer term impacts, though, are really unclear. Very Most studies were cross-sectional. They didn't have long term or longitudinal follow up. So it was unclear to see how, how people actually recovered and adjusted to in the longer term. There were very few studies that looked at the impacts in terms of children and young people. So there was very little that we could actually say um, in terms of that. So everything um, has been, I think I would it'd be fair to say, a great learning experience for us in the past uh, year and a half around what the impacts have been and what might be effective in terms of mitigation. So what do we know now? I mentioned, um, you know, mental health goes way beyond uh, child and adolescent mental health referrals, these are the tip of the iceberg. But they do give us an indication of what the current situation around mental health and well-being for young people, children and young people is. Um, because if a young person, you know, when the situation has resulted in a, a young person needing a referral to a CAM service, generally things have been quite tough for them um, for a while. And what we have seen, and you can see from this graph, is that the pandemic caused a large decrease. So, so lockdown resulting in a large decrease in referrals um, to child and adolescent mental health services. So I'd already mentioned we've seen this trend upwards, then this significant drop. Now things began to recover when schools returned, 
And so you see that pattern happening towards the late summer last year, um, increasing towards the end of December. And then we see another lockdown period. And again, that drop in referrals and a subsequent increase once schools reopen. Now, there is a question about whether, you know, we, we might interpret what that is about, whether it's about access to services, whether it's about psychological access to services, whether it's about you know, schools being somewhere where young people feel safe to see someone, or whether there um, are potentially, uh, it's, it's a place where issues are, or come to the fore. Well, certainly there was a strong patterning around that in terms of those kind of referrals. I think the important thing for us to bear in mind, though, is that each of these young represents a child or a young person or who are going to cope um, and are in distress. And as I mentioned, we know that lifelong mental health problems tend to have their roots, certainly in the period of adolescence. And so missing those key factors which we know are protective, education, disconnection from social relationships. That point for all of us in adolescence where one of the key tasks for us is to um, have those formative romantic relationships. Well, all of those developmental tasks for young people have been disrupted. And for some young people, that may mean that the developmental trajectory that they were on is not the path that they are now on, that they may not have the potential to fulfil their potential that they would have had. So what do we know in terms of this? So we, we know that child and adolescent mental health referrals have recovered, are um, edging above. So the, the figures were comparable, but slightly higher than the CAMS referrals at that point in 2019. Um, and what else have we learned about the impacts of mental health and well-being. I mentioned that I sit on the um, Scottish Government's advi sub-advisory group for education and children's issues. So every, every two weeks my team produce an evidence scan where we pull out the latest evidence both from a national and an international level and that looks both at the evidence of transmission but also the wider harms and impacts including mental health. Now I think it's fair to say that initially the research that was emerging on this was of fairly poor quality. It was dominated by papers on transmission um, and studies looking explicitly at these wider impacts and harms on uh, young people were largely absent. However, they started to develop at pace and there is now quite a large body of evidence which has looked at this issue. Um, I would say that generally, though it's sat in the context of school closures, um, rather than uh, the pandemic per se, but I, I wanted to highlight um, a, a few key better quality systematic reviews where we're more confident in, in what the findings are actually telling us. So they are suggesting, as we might have anticipated, that given the, the the nature of the event that we've experienced, that levels of depression and anxiety are higher, that those are greater for adolescents than younger children. Um, again, particularly in terms of for girls, um, in terms of depression. We know that the closures of schools really had a significant negative impact on the overall mental health and psychological well-being of children and their families and young people. That it has resulted in disrupted learning, learning loss and impacts on attainment. And it has also increased risk and we know that that has increased risk for children and young people who are living in unsafe situations in terms of um, risk of abuse and harm. Um, so it is a picture that suggests to us 
that the pandemic is likely to have exacerbated those pre-existing challenges in mental health impacts for young people and that those young people who are already experiencing a greater burden are experiencing an even greater burden. So it's exacerbated those social um, determinants of mental health. Now, a piece of work that I did earlier in the summer as well with World Health Organization is that we held a consultation. And that consultation was with UNESCO, UNICEF and um, UNFPA. And it was to look at adolescent well-being. And we involved a range of technical experts from across the European region. But we also worked really hard to include adolescents within this um, meeting and what their views on the impacts of on their mental health and well-being had been. Um, and what they wanted, what they wanted from governments. We, we had a pre-session with adolescents and also we had um, adolescents co-chair our sessions within the meeting. And what was really important was they, they recognised the vital connection between mental health and positive functioning and well-being. They knew that it, for them it has economic impacts, it has the potential, the disruption to their schooling, they recognise that it has the potential to impact their um, life trajectory. And they said that for us, there was, an, that the pandemic had really shone a light on the need to address the short term um, impact on mental health of adolescents and that they needed effective evidence based programmes that were both universal and targeted and that they needed, that we needed to listen to the views of young people, that they needed to be within the planning and development of programmes and interventions, not just something that was a tokenistic consultation. And I think the enshrinement of the UNCRC within Scotland gives us a strong footing to, to move forward with that when we talk about recovery and addressing some of the mental health impacts of the pandemic on young people. Now, I am aware of time, and I just wanted to cover off something with you. And so bear with me on this, because this is slightly tangential, but it comes from my background as a clinical psychologist. And my thesis was on work around how we cope with life-threatening events in the life-threatening treatment in the context of life-threatening illness and that impact of severe stress on people. And what it highlights, and I think this is quite important in terms of a public health approach and our thinking about this, is that the way we experience an event determines our ability to cope with it. But that in and of itself is determined by the resources which we have available to us. So those resources, if we have financial resources or emotional and supportive resources, are really critical, enabling us to actually deal with those stressful events that have occurred. And that becomes particularly important if we think about this in the context of the pandemic, because what we've seen is an extended period of time in which most stressors have been experienced by children and young people. Now, when you don't have sufficient resources to cope or your attempts at coping fail, um, and that's what results in distress. Now, if I was to say to you, so just as a quick example here, um, you've received a £50 bill this morning because your gas charges have gone up because of the increase in energy charges. Now, for the vast majority of us, that's not even something. It's benign or irrelevant if you look at this model because we have the resources that enable us to cope. If, however, you don't have that money, that suddenly triggers this, this experience of, right, how do I cope? Is there a mechanism or the resources that I can tap into? So that's problem based coping. If there aren't, do you have to cope with that emotionally? Do you then have to cope with that by you know, self medicating, by other various means? If you can't resolve it, you can get stuck in this loop of distress of trying to cope with a problem, trying to resolve it. But actually, the, that indicates to me that there are mechanisms or the things that public health and the, the things that we um, 
want to do the things that we are good at doing have a really important role to play in disrupting this cycle of distress and enabling young people to cope and that's through three key things really primarily is through access to resource so ensuring that there's the opportunity to engage in education, that schools are the last thing to close and the first thing to open, that there is access to community education, youth workers, that there is relational support for families, that there is access to income maximisation, that there are acts that we continue to restructure society so that families have the resources, both financial and relational that enable them to manage and cope with incredibly stressful life events and that we restructure as public health desires to do our society in order that actually those inequalities no longer exist. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Eileen. That's an absolutely perfect note to end on. Um, thanks so much. Um, and again, just invite everyone to put some ideas uh, for questions in the Q&A box for Eileen. Um, so if I can invite uh, Suzanne back on, um, we can take a look at the Q&A because I think we've had a few questions for Suzanne come in. So um, while you're thinking about questions for Eileen, um, Suzanne, one of our attendees asks about your thoughts on universal credit and the implementation of the um, cut to that and the potential for its impact on the Scottish Welfare Fund, how that might impact on the experience of people with homelessness in Scotland? Um, I mean, uh, I, I, I suppose there's a couple, couple of points I'd make. One is that I, I think that the impact of universal, the universal credit cut is going to have a very direct impact on levels of, <coughs> excuse me, destitution. Um, and, and, and kind of more extreme forms of poverty. So it's, it's clearly, you know, it was a, it made a massive positive difference when the £20 uplift was, was introduced. And so there'll be a, a very negative impact of it being, being taken away. That said, I don't think it will have a direct impact on levels of homelessness in Scotland, actually, or, or elsewhere in, 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 in GB, because those are more directly linked with housing allowance parts of the welfare system. So, um, uh, you know, we fully mitigated the bedroom tax in Scotland, but that has a big impact down south. And also the local housing allowance has an impact in Scotland, but has more of an impact down south. So I don't think we'll see a sort of direct follow through in terms of levels of, of homelessness. But I think what we will do, as is, is the questioners um, alluding to, is see um, implications for destitution and more extreme forms of poverty, which will then increase pressure on emer the emergency fund that's represented by the Scottish Welfare Fund. Now, the Scottish Welfare Fund, I know, is, is far from perfect. My colleague Morag Trainer and others have, have, have looked at some of the weaknesses in it recently. But I'm always looking at these things, I suppose, relative to elsewhere in the UK. And the Scottish Welfare Fund is night and day better than what you've got in England um, and better than what actually, well, more difficult to compare with Wales, but certainly much better than what you have in England. And in vast tracts of England, you have nothing at all. It was localised... Um, back in 2013 and most uh, or at least a, a large proportion of English local authorities ended any kind of um, uh, equivalent of what was the social fund and so on so you know the, the Scottish Welfare Fund is something very precious and something we should really do all we can uh, to protect because it's extraordinarily important for people in that and in, in those crises. Uh, situations. I think the, 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 the relationship is more direct with destitution than it is with homelessness. Okay, thanks, Suzanne. That's really interesting. And um, just while we're waiting for other questions to come in, particularly those for Eileen, um, another one for you, if that's okay. Um, you touched a little bit on some of the comparisons internationally. Um, and we've had a question about whether Scotland's positive story is a positive one per se, or if it's just in contrast to other parts of the UK. And perhaps you could reflect a little bit about how Scotland compares internationally in terms of its response to COVID-19 among people with homelessness. Um, I mean, uh Scotland compares um, extremely well, as is, is, is the short answer. I mean, we are. I mean, the, the, to be fair, the UK as a whole compares extremely well um, to to most other parts of. Uh, I mean, the, the work that we're doing at the moment involves Global South countries as well as Global North, and of course, in the Global South, they have overwhelming challenges in terms of absolute resource constraints and, and large numbers of people affected by extreme forms of, of housing needs and homelessness. So, but even if you compare us to, to other sort of global north um, countries, 
um, you know, our response in terms of getting everybody in, keeping everybody in, you know, with some issues, offering, certainly at the beginning, offering decent levels of support. That was actually true across the UK. Um, probably the UK and Australia stand out internationally is where we got it right during COVID, whereas North America was pretty catastrophic, including Canada and, and the US and, and many parts anyway. Um, and Europe is a very, um, I mean, I don't know the, the story right across Europe, but certainly in the, 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 the case study areas we've seen, it was a very variable picture. So I do think that um, our starting position was stronger in, in, in the UK than elsewhere, particularly within Scotland, and we did better during the COVID pandemic, partly because we had less of a mountain to climb because we had a better starting position. Um, so um, I think if you look at whether you put Scotland in the context of um, the UK or the wider global north, we, we, you know, our response is, is much better. That said, there are issues and those issues are concentrated in Glasgow um, because, partly because Glasgow has just got the biggest problem um, in terms of street homelessness. Uh, particularly, and I do think, it, you know, as I said in the presentation, it was widely acknowledged that the position in the emergency hotels at the beginning of lockdown was pretty catastrophic. I mean, it was not a safe place. There was some really terrible things happened, um, and you know, people were, to be fair, people were working at pace in an you know unprecedented situation, and people were doing their best but it was pretty dangerous in those emergency hotels to begin with. Um, but I think it then, it, it then got much better. But yeah, I, I would say that on a lot, in, both in terms of legal and policy, from a legal and a policy position, we do compare very, very well. That's helpful. Thanks so much, Suzanne. Um, hopefully we can capture some of those lessons and sustain them in the future. Um, a question for Eileen, if that's okay. Um, I thought it was very interesting your reflections from the systematic review on lessons from previous pandemics and that there were you mentioned the evidence is quite thin and um, if you're reflecting on this pandemic in terms of lessons for the next ones particularly in relation to children and mental well-being what, what would be your recommendations it's an interesting question emily and i think that what we have learned and, and it's been particularly you know that the the need to protect education at all costs, that you see the impact of withdrawing what is actually a universal service and the protective function that that has for children and families. Um, I think the need to ensure that there is family support, that there is access to resources, as I mentioned, so that families, because one of the key challenges, I think, in terms of initially with the pandemic was, and particularly for families who were living in poverty, basic things like access to um, IT equipment, access to data, access to um, basic materials like paper and things. And again, I think, as Suzanne mentioned, actually, that the response in Scotland compared to other countries to, to put children and young people at the, the you know, to prioritise that, if, if we think back to... Um, so the, the previous lockdown earlier this year, you know, schools returned before any other part of society was open. I think that we were, were almost unique in doing that. Um, but it's about ensuring that those structures and supports are in place and, and things, again, um, as I talked about restructuring society, so things like citizens' basic income um, could have a really important role to play in ensuring that families have the resources that they're able to spend um, Thanks so much for that. Those are some really conscious of time, but those are some really interesting reflections. And I think they actually chime really nicely with some of Suzanne's reflections on the situation from the homelessness sector. So I'm so sorry that we've run out of time because it just feels like the discussion is just getting going and we're getting even more questions and answers um, coming through the chat. So I'm really sorry that we've run out of time, but it's been an absolutely brilliant session. I've really enjoyed hearing from you both and the questions that have come through. So the next webinar is on the 7th of October. Um, we're going to be talking about the commercial determinants of health. So please do check that one out. It's, uh, it can be found on the SCOTFO and GCPH website for more details. So I'd just like to say another huge thank you to Suzanne and Eileen as our speakers and to you all for attending. Um, and you should be able to receive the um, link to the slides and the recordings later on. So look forward to seeing you all on the 7th of October. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, Emily. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.